Hello everyone. So in this lecture, uh, we will take a deep dive into two file systems, specifically FAT, uh, which is file allocation table and uh, ext2. So the reading for this lecture would be from chapter 10 of Dinosaur Book and uh, a quick reminder. So there will be a guest lecture on uh, Thursday, this Thursday, where uh, uh, a presentation will be given by Chad, who is the CEO of one of the startups that deals with uh, ubiquitous authentication system. Basically, they are developing a technology where you can use single device, basically your smartphone to authenticate to any device that can communicate through internet. Basically, you can use the phone to unlock your door. You can use the phone to do sudo on your machine. You can use the phone to log in into your Facebook account, so on and so forth. Even, I guess they also use the, you, they also have a plugin for your car that you can use your phone to unlock the car. So basically you just keep your phone in your pocket and when you go near the car, if your phone is like the door gets opened by knowing that the phone is near the car, okay? So there are many different authentication schemes that they have and uh, I really think uh, it would be nice to know the challenges that you'd be facing if at all, uh, if you want to go to like when you go to the real world and when you deal with real systems, the kind of challenges that you have to face and uh, like what are the common practices that you use to develop software, so on and so forth. I really think uh, the presentation would be of uh, like could can provide great insights to us. Okay, uh, now let's look into different file systems. So before looking into file systems, let's first get a brief uh, refresher of what are the things that are needed to have a file system, okay? So the plan for this lecture would be first, we'll look into uh, some design considerations that any file system should take. And then we will look into FAT and ext2. So to access any file, so given a file name, and corresponding offset within that file that we want to access. First, we need to get the corresponding inode number, right? How do we get it? We refer to the directory. Given a file name, we get the directory in which the file is present. And from that directory, we know the inode corresponding to that file. Okay. That will give us the inode number and the offset and then finally, using the inode and the offset, we can go to the corresponding storage block and access the data. Okay. And the code in, on the slide shows different ways in which we can access a file. And uh, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, there are various system calls that are sub provided by Linux to uh, perform various operations on the file. So the key data structures of uh, a file system is inode, which actually contains all the data pertaining to a file, like specifically its metadata, like size, permissions, so on and so forth. And then we also have inodes also contain the storage blocks, which contain the data corresponding to the file. Okay. And we also have directories. So directories are files, but they are special files where the content is just list of file name and inode numbers. And furthermore, a file system also needs to keep track of like, disk blocks, which disk blocks are free, which disk blocks are allocated, so that when uh, when it when a disk block is needed for a file, it can get from free pool. And it also knows when not to allocate, like when to avoid collisions. So these are the three data structures which any file system should have at least. So, and uh, in order to design a file system, we should know what kind of accesses or what are the common ways in which file system is accessed by users. So a study on file system workload showed that most of the times 
on most of the systems, majority of the files are small. Okay, I mean, this kind of intuitively makes sense, right? On your machine, when you look into your machine, most of the files are relatively small. Okay, you have only very few large files. Okay? And, uh, and large files actually consume a lot of space. Okay, when, when we go to the space that is occupied on the disk, it's usually the large files that occupy big big chunk of space or like total storage occupied by big files is more than the total storage occupied by the small files. That is because even though small files are more, in total, they don't occupy like large disk space. It's the large files that occupy the large disk space. So, so when you look into your file system, for instance, if you look at the disk space usage, you'll see that uh, the major, uh, like if your disk space, like let's say if you have used 10 GB of the disk space, you might notice that let's say 60% of the disk space, that is like six GB of your disk is occupied by usually large files. Okay, like uh, maybe some VM or some movie or some zip file, which is usually large, right? So the total storage is like the majority of total storage is occupied by large files. However, when you look into the total files, it's usually the majority of the files are of small size. Okay. And when we look into file accesses, okay, most of the times we access small files. So most of the times, like in when we are regularly using the system, we usually use small files, like opening a binary, running a program, or like opening certain small file to edit, uh, like document files, so on and so forth. It's usually small files that we access more often. Okay. However, the IO bytes, or like the uh, when we go to the disk and if you see the total number of IO bytes transferred by the disk, those bytes are usually of the large files. That is because like when you, even, even, even when we access large files rarely, most of the times we have to access most of the large file data. So that's why the IO transfers are usually, majority of the IO transfers are consumed by large files. So based on this uh, known system workload, a file system design should be, should like, uh, sh should maximize access for both small files and large files, specifically for small files. It's better to use smaller blocks because we want to be efficient when it comes to storage. So for smaller files, it's better to use small block sizes because uh, we can then use the storage more efficiently without fragmentation, okay? And furthermore, the files that are commonly used together should be stored together. For instance, uh, let's say a binary and the corresponding libraries that it uses should be stored together, maybe in the same cylinder or maybe in the same, uh, like same sector, right? For large files, it's better to have larger blocks, okay? Because it will avoid uh, any bookkeeping that we may need to keep. Okay? And furthermore, for large files, it's better to have contigu uh, contiguous allocation so that we can do fast sequential lookup. Like when you have to access sequentially, then it's easy if if we have a contiguous allocation, especially for large files. Furthermore, when we have, when we want to access randomly, we want to be efficient. So we should have an efficient lookup mechanism in case of large files. But unfortunately, it's hard to predict future, right? It's hard to predict what if, uh, when a file is created, what that file will turn out to be, right? When you create a file, it may be a small file, it could remain a small file or it could become a large file, you don't know, or rather the file system cannot predict it. So it's, it's difficult to uh, like optimize your file system 
for one set of files because you cannot predict the future. Okay, so let's now look into different file systems and we'll see what are the design considerations, like what are the design decisions that they make to provide efficient accesses, uh, efficient access for both small files and large files. So in the next part, we will look into a file allocation table, FAT, and in the later part, we will look into ext3, ext2, sorry. Thank you.